Welcome to Free Christian Church of God's video outreach ministry, bringing the gospel message of Jesus Christ into your home each and every Sunday morning. If you would like more information about the video ministry or other ministries that we have to offer, stay tuned immediately following this program. And now, open your Bibles and follow along as we bring you today's message. Mark chapter 8, lift your Bible in the air, say it with me. This is my Bible. It's God's infallible word. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. Today, I'll be taught the word of God. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the word of God. My mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. Mark chapter 8, verse 22. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. So Jesus took the blind man by the hand, and he led him outside of the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on a man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And Jesus sent him home, saying, Don't go into the village. God, I pray for your anointing over this word today. Father, I love this story. I love this story because it's so practical for the way that many of us have lived our lives. And God, it just shows you the depths and the, and, and the strength and the of your love, and God, where you will go to save us. Father, I pray your anointing over the word today. We bind the enemy in the name of Jesus, cast him away from this place, and God, we just pray that this will be a holy sanctuary where your will is done in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Quite often we're guilty of reading our Bible like we do the daily newspaper. Now, when I get the newspaper, I have a routine. Do you? How many of you read in the newspaper? Regular. I, now, my, my dad used to read the newspaper for hours. You know, he would read everything in the paper. I don't do that. I don't, do, I don't have time to do that. And, you know, I've got a pattern. I'll, I'll read the headline, and then I'll flip inside to the obituaries, and if my name ain't in there, I keep going. You know, and, and I, I read the police reports, see if any of you all been in trouble, you know, things like that. And, and I kind of have my pattern where I go through the paper, but sometimes we're guilty of reading the Bible the same way. We skim over it, we skip through it, we, we look for the headlines that catch our eye, we search out the highlights and avoid the things that would challenge us or the things that would make us think. We seek out the positives that make us feel good about being bad and ignore the passages of Scripture that convict us of our sin. We, we peruse through the things that we already know or the things that we easily understand, and we avoid the passages that require us to do research or to study. You see, we like easy things. We like the path of least resistance. We, especially as Americans, we are conditioned almost to be soft. And because we like easy things, we sometimes are, are too casual in our approach to the Word of God. We now buy our Bibles specially equipped with tools that make them easier for us to read them more efficiently. We have highlighted words and side captions and bold headings and pictures so we can catch the meat of God's Word without digging into the depths of it. Our lives are so busy that we no longer take the time to study God's Word as we should. And because of that, we miss out on some really good things. I want you to know that every word in the Bible is important. Every word in the Bible is relevant. Every word in the Bible has the power to encourage the discouraged. Every word has the power to lift up the fallen and to give hope to the helpless. Every word in the Bible that you hold in your hand has the power to transform your life. From in the beginning in Genesis 1-1 to the amen at the end of Revelation 22, every punctuation mark, every comma, every period, every question mark, and exclamation point serve a purpose that we cannot afford to overlook. Every last detail of this book, every last detail of this God breathe inspired in a fallibly perfect book is valuable you don't believe me you don't believe there should have been way more amens than that you don't believe me there was a time when we considered the bible to be a sacred book do you remember that time 
There was a time when we took care of our Bible, where our Bible was precious. It's not like today when we go out of the church on Sunday morning and then throw it in the back seat. And then when Sunday rolls around next week, we, we look through the back seat to see if we can find it again. We have it all stuffed full of papers and all kinds of, of garbage that's in there that had not to be in there. We don't take care of our Bible like we should because we don't, we don't revere it as the Word of God. The Bible says Jesus came to Bethsaida. That's usually something that we skip over. After all, it wasn't Jerusalem or Bethlehem or Rome that's mentioned here. It was just Bethsaida. Now, I, I'm thankful that God doesn't think like we do. I'm thankful that God doesn't put prices on things and rate people like we sometimes do. I, I'm thankful that God values every one of us the same, that he counts each one of us worth enough to send his son to die on a cross for our sins if we were the only sinner in the whole wide world. And you know why God does that? He does that because God knows that he created everything and everything that he created is good. Everything he created is good and worthwhile and valuable. Jesus came to Bethsaida. Now, Bethsaida was a, a small, insignificant fishing village located on the east bank of the Jordan River where it flowed into the Sea of Galilee. How many of you grew up in a small town? You live in northwest Ohio. You can't help but grow up in a small town, can you? I grew up in a small town, and, and because of that, I, I probably appreciate it more than the people who haven't. Yesterday, uh, my brother's running for Congress, and so he asked me if I go drive a car with signs on it in a parade. So I went to a little town, and I, and I drove the car in the parade. And, and uh, I'm sitting there waiting about an hour for this thing to start. And now, people, I don't want to insult you, but you know our little parades is about the dorkiest thing that we could possibly do. We, we line up every year, set our chairs out on the edge of the road. And we're on the edge of our seat. We get there early so we can have a good seat to watch the fire trucks, some guys, old muscle car, a couple of horses, and a high school band to go by. And it's the same parade every year. When I was a kid, I, I grew up watching the Labor Day parade over at Oakwood. Have you ever been to that? It's kind of like Macy's, just a little different. Uh, <laughs> I, I went to it every year of my life that I could remember. And then I went off to college, and, and, and I had to go back to school before Labor Day. And I missed, for four years, I missed that parade. And I thought, oh, man, I just missed going to that parade. That parade was just so much fun. That was, you know how we do. And after I graduated, I couldn't wait. It was finally, I finally got to go see the Labor Day parade again. I watched the parade, and it was exactly the same parade that I had seen for 20 years before that. I mean, that's what we do. But I, I was in a small town yesterday, and, and they were regular people. They were regular people, people sitting in their lawn chairs with no shoes or socks on, you know, sitting out there playing with their feet, you know, waiting to pick up candy, you know, <laughs> as people were going by. And, and, and I was watching that, and you know, they're just regular people. They're just regular people, but God loves regular people. God loves regular people. This city was near where Jesus had fed the 5,000 with loaves and fishes. Now, I think this helps us to understand why so many people were hungry that day when they came to hear Jesus preach. Jesus was preaching to poor people. He was preaching to regular people. He's preaching to moms and dads who had a gaggle of kids and a mortgage on their house. He was preaching to regular people who worked long hours at dead-end jobs trying to eke out a living. That's why Jesus fed the 5,000. He had compassion on them. He knew what their needs were, and he loved them enough to take care of those needs. God loves you enough to take care of you if you follow him. If you sit down at his feet and you listen to his words, he knows what your needs are. And if you get yourself into a position where you will listen to him, he'll feed you. He'll feed you. He'll take care of you. He'll fill your belly and he will heal your sickness and he'll protect you from those who want to hurt you. The name Bethsaida literally means the house of fish. Now, if you were looking to move to a new community or to buy some land to build a new house, or to start up a new business, how many of you would go to a place called House of Fish? Sometimes it's bad enough just being from Continental, or Defiance, or Ayersville, or Ottawa, take your pick. But how would you like this, somebody to come up to you and say, where are you from? And you'd have to say to them, I'm from House of Fish, Ohio. 
If you study the geography of the day, you'll find that Bethsaida was actually the name of two towns that were separated by a narrow stream. It was, it, it was a lot like uh, some of our towns are today. There's a, one part of the town and there's another part of the town, though they all carry the same name. On the eastern side of the stream was Bethsaida Julius, named after the daughter of the Roman emperor Tiberius Caesar. And it was a beautiful and a developed city. Uh, but on the western side of the stream was Bethsaida the village, the house of fish. And it was small and poor. It wasn't something out of a Norman Rockwell painting, but it was a tiny, smelly fishing village with regular people who worked hard at regular jobs without any hope of getting further up the social ladder. There were real people with real problems and, and real struggles and real needs. Bethsaida, the village, was the other side of the tracks, or in this case, it was the other side of the street. But God knew where they were. And he sent Jesus, his son, to this little town. Typically, when we read our Bible, we skip over those things. We give little interest to titles and names of people and places. But I want you to know that Jesus came to this small, insignificant, remote village for a divine reason. I've told you before, and I'll tell you again, God doesn't go anywhere without a reason. He doesn't show up anywhere without a purpose, but God always has a plan. God always has a plan. In Mark 1, the Bible says Jesus came to Jordan to be baptized. That's why he came. And then he went into the wilderness to be tempted. And then from there, he went into Galilee to call his disciples. Everywhere he went, he had a purpose. He came from down from preaching to the multitude on the mountain to heal a leper. And then he entered Capernaum to heal the centurion's servant. And from there, he went to Peter's house to heal Peter's mother-in-law. Miracle I'm sure Peter never forgot. Then he got in a boat, and he climbed the storm. And he went, you'll get that on the way home, just laugh and laugh. He got off of the boat, and he cast the demons out of the, the, the Gadarene. Do I need to go on? In Mark chapter 2, he got back on the boat, and he went to his hometown where he healed the paralytic. And from there, he went to call Matthew into the ministry and to raise the ruler's daughter from the dead and to heal an old woman with a 12-year-old medical problem. He went on from there to heal the blind and cast out some more demons. He fed thousands and he walked on the water. In Matthew 9.35, it says that Jesus went through all of the towns and all of the villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness. Do you see a pattern? Do you see a pattern? I don't read anywhere in the Bible where it says that Jesus went somewhere to do nothing. We do that, don't we, Tom? We have places we go to do nothing. But Jesus didn't go anywhere to do nothing. You see, we don't understand the power of God's presence. We just don't get it. We don't understand that when we get close to God, or when God gets close to us, that something has to change. You see, there are some church people, some quote-unquote Christians, and some congregations where nothing is happening because Jesus isn't there. Because where Jesus is, things have to happen. The evidence of the presence of God in a place or in a person's life is change toward godliness. Not just change. Not just change. We change a lot of things. We can change our clothes and change the paint on the wall and change the sign out front. I'm not talking about just change, but I'm talking about a change toward godliness. God's holiness does not allow anything or anybody to get close to him until whatever it is becomes like him. And if it refuses to become like him, then it's destroyed by his holy judgment. Where Jesus went, there were things happening because they couldn't help but happen. Jesus couldn't be somewhere and not affect his surroundings. What am I telling you, church? I'm telling you that if you dare approach the presence of God that is here today, he will change you. And if you are here today and something in you does not change, you didn't get close enough. The presence of God doesn't arrive anywhere without a reason. The Holy Spirit never goes anywhere to do nothing. God never wastes time, but he is where he is to do what only he can do. God promised in Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I will be in the midst of them. And church, I want you to know we have a quorum. We have met the quota, we've met the requirements, and God is here today, and he's come here to do what only he can do. That excites me. That excites me because I'm thinking, what is God going to change today? Who is God going to change today? What are we going to see and experience because God is in this place? You ought to be unglued by now. 
Maybe God's come here today to challenge your holiness. You thought you had it together, but when the light of God's word shined on you and the Holy Spirit began to move inside of you, you realized that you weren't as good of a Christian as you thought you were. You've been saved for years. You've sat on the church boards. You've admired by your peers, but God is calling you to come up higher, and he's challenging you to come into his presence and be changed. Maybe he's come here to confront your sin. You backslidden. You aren't living where you used to live, and you know it. You're still in church, and you're still going through the motions, but you don't love God like you used to love God. You don't serve God like you used to serve God. You don't love the fellowship of God's people like you used to. You're spending more time with the godless than you are with the godly, and your spirit is broken, and you know that you need to come back home and be changed. Maybe he's come here today to heal your sickness. You never really thought about it. You've been to the doctors and you've been to the specialist. You've taken the medication or gone through the treatments, but you never thought about just stepping forward into the presence of God and allowing your problem to melt away in his glory. Maybe God wants to change you today. Maybe God has come here today to provide for your needs. You're hurting and you've been struggling and doing without, but God wants to put some meal in your barrel and some oil in your cruise. He wants to take your loaves and your fishes and feed the people that you love that are around you and then give you basketfuls of blessings. God has come here today to make a difference in your life, and he is daring you to draw near to him. He's daring you. Now, you might not have been thinking about that when you decided to show up for church today. You might not have come to church with expectation or anticipation. You, you might have just stumbled in here for all the wrong reasons. But the ground that you're treading on is holy ground because the presence of God is in this place, and he is about to do something spectacular. The word says they brought to Jesus a blind man. Now, I want you to pay attention here. The fact of the initiative seems to have come from the people that brought him more than from the blind man himself. I see this happening through the scriptures. You remember the, the crippled man that laid on his bed, how they brought him to Jesus and they tore a hole in the roof and they dropped him through the hole in the roof. That wasn't his idea. And this blind man, it wasn't his idea either. No one until the time of Jesus had ever been healed of blindness. It was a miracle that Jesus was the very first to perform. So the people who were blind knew that blindness was terminal. They were convinced that their case was hopeless, so why in the world even take it to Jesus and expect anything different? Maybe this is where you are today. You're convinced that you're too far gone for the power of God. You believe that there might be hope for other people. There just isn't any hope for you. You might have already given up, but I want you to know that there is a power here today that you've not accounted for, and it's the presence of the holy and righteous and powerful God, and he's about to rock your world if you get close enough. This man was blind. This man was blind. My grandpa Eads, the old preacher grandpa of mine, used to say there's only one thing wrong with the blind man. He just can't see. He just can't see. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to be blind? Some of us I have enough trouble just stumbling to our bed in the middle of the night. We know what the room looks like in the daylight, but, and we know where everything is. But as soon as the light goes out, everything in the room starts to move. You ever do that? We bump into things, and we trip over things, and we stub our toes. Oh, I hate stubbing my toe. I hate stubbing my It just ruins my whole. I'll be ready for bed. I'll be tired. I'm going to lay down. I'm going to go to sleep. And I get about this close to the bed, and I forgot there was a post under the one side. And boom, kick it with my foot. And then I'm up for another hour. Have you ever considered what it, you would miss out on and what you could no longer do if you were blind? Couldn't watch TV. Probably shouldn't drive your car. <laughs> Have you ever thought about how your level of dependency would change and how your life would be altered and what adjustments you would have to make if you could no longer see? We often don't appreciate what we have until it's taken away from us. We don't fully appreciate our health until we get sick. We don't fully appreciate our mobility until we're unable to get around like we used to. We don't fully appreciate our children until our house is empty. And I know we can't wait to appreciate ours. Uh, we, <laughs> we don't fully appreciate our husband or our wife until they passed into eternity. By the same token, we can't appreciate what we don't have until we experience living our life without it. Has anybody ever told you you don't know what you're missing? You don't know what you're missing. You see, this blind man didn't know what he was missing because he had been blind his whole life. 
But he wasn't just physically blind. He was also spiritually blind. He couldn't see that Jesus was the Son of God. He couldn't see that Jesus had the power to give him his sight. He couldn't see that Jesus could change his life completely. He couldn't see that Jesus could set him free from his present situation and give to him a life that he never believed to be possible. But so many people are spiritually blind today. They're not seeking God. They're not wandering into church, hoping to find an answer. That's why Jesus commanded you and me, go out in the highways and the hedges and you bring them in. Bring them in. Bring them in. Don't wait until their eyes are open to the need of God, but you go and find the people who can't see and bring them in. Jesus said, go get the blind. Go get the needy. Go and get the lonely. Go and get the alcoholics and the drug addicts. Go and get the abandoned and afraid. Go and get the unwed mothers. Go and get the fatherless and the widows. Go and get the abused. Go and get the people who don't know me and bring them to me so I can give them life. We need some go-getters in the church. We need some go-getters in the church. If your husband or wife is lost and they're without Christ, you can't wait until they get the urge to come to church. If your children are living without God, you can't wait until they want to seek God's face. If your friends are wandering aimlessly in the darkness of sin, you can't wait till they see the light, but you have to go get them and bring them to the light. You have to take the initiative. Then the word says, Jesus took the blind man by the hand and he led him out of town. He took the blind man out of his usual surroundings. He took him out uh, of the place that he lived as a beggar. He took him away from the people who only knew him as a blind man. He took him out of the context that identified him as a hopeless case, and he took this blind man somewhere else so he could give to him a new identity. If you ever want God to make a difference in your life, you have to change your atmosphere. You have to change your surroundings. You can't keep hanging out with the same old people in the same old places where you're only known by your handicap, but you have to allow God to lead you somewhere else so he can give you a new identity. You have to get away from the places that identify you by your handicap. You have to get away from the people who are just as handicapped as you are. You have to get away from the crowd that tells you there's nothing wrong with you because you're exactly like them. You have to get away from the people who have no sight and get around some people who can see so they can enlighten you on what you're missing. If you're around something abnormal long enough, it isn't long until it seems normal to you. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you live with the pigs long enough, there'll come a day when the smell won't bother you. The slop won't bother you. The mess won't bother you. The oinks and the squeals won't bother you. Some people don't know how bad it is because they've never seen anything better. And that's why God put the church here. That's why he put the church here. We are here to present to those who are spiritually blind a contrast. We are intentionally different. We are intentionally different. We are different on purpose. You're not listening to church. We are different on purpose. We are different because we choose to be different. We purposely don't look like the world. We purposely don't smell like the world. We purposely don't sound like the world or act like the world because we are people of sight. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound to save the rest like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I can see. It doesn't matter where you have been. It doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter how the world has labeled you. If your sin that has handicapped you has been put under the blood of Jesus Christ, God says it's gone. You are a new creation. The old things are passed away, and everything in your life has become new. Now, there might be some people who will try to take your sin that is under the blood and pull it out from under the blood. I got thinking about this this week, and it really aggravated me. Because I see people do, I see church people do this. I see church people do this all of the time. Somebody will be forgiven. They will take that sin that they committed 40 years ago and put it under the blood, but some holier-than-thou church person will look at them, well, hey, we can't use him. He was blind. We can't trust him. He was blind. We, he can't serve. Who does he think he is? Who are you and who am I 
to take a sin that's been put under the blood and pull it back out from under the blood. Who are you and I to hold a grudge against anybody that has repented of their sin and said, God will never use you. God can't you. You can't. Who are you? Jesus led him out of town. Now, I was going to skip this part because I preached on it several times before, but God wanted me to preach on it again because he said that you didn't get it the first time. The word says, and Jesus spit on his eyes. I really don't know how to spiritualize that. Every time I read it, all I can think is, thank God we use anointing oil. <laughs> Tom, come forward. I'd like to anoint you. <laughs> Here's a man that is blind, brought to Jesus against him. Now imagine this guy. He, he is blind. He's brought to Jesus against his own judgment. Then Jesus takes him by the hand, leads him out of town, and away from the things that he knows, and away from the people that he knows, everything he's familiar with, and then he spits on him. Put yourself in his shoes. I mean, what if some stranger blindfolded you, took you by the hand, led you into the woods somewhere, and then spit on you? The good thing is he was blind, and he didn't see it coming. <laughs> yeah, that you get. Yeah, that... If the people who brought this blind man to Jesus would have told him, now, when you get to Jesus, this is what he's going to do. He's going to take you by the hand. Yeah. And then he's going to lead you out of town. Yeah. And then he's going to spit on you. My guess is he probably would have said, I ain't going. Why? Because the process would not have appealed to him. Now, listen to this. So many people today want what God has to offer them, but they say, I'm not going to do that to get it. The process doesn't appeal to them. I want to go to heaven when I die, but I'm not going to the altar during the church invitation. I want God to help me with my problems, but I'm gonna, not going to humble myself and get down on my knees. I want God to deliver me from my trouble, but I'm not about to call the preacher to come to my house. I want the benefits of being a child of God, but I'm not going to live like some fanatic around my old friends. Well, if that's your attitude, then you're going to stay blind. Because you're only going to receive God's help when you are submissive to him. He won't deliver you until you surrender to his will and trust him and take him by the hand and allow him to lead you to where he wants you to go. Jesus spit on his eyes and he laid his hands on him. He said, do you see anything? And the man said, I see tree, men as trees walking around. Now, I'm sure that this man could identify smells with accuracy. He'd been blind his whole life. I, I imagine that there's somebody come walking up and he knew who they were just by the scent alone. I'm sure that his touch was so sensitive that he could just pass his hand over something and tell you what it was. I, I believe that his hearing was probably uh, attuned to sounds that most of us couldn't distinguish, but he had never seen before, and seeing was unnatural to him. Now, he thought that he knew what it would be like if he could see. He made up in his mind what the world would look like, and he saw. but when he saw for the first time, he didn't think he was seeing it clearly. You have an idea of what you think being a real Christian is, but when God opens your eyes, there will be things that you see that will not be as you have imagined them. When somebody comes to Christ for the first time, there are many things that they don't readily understand. They have to make adjustments and gain knowledge of what walking with God is all about. Everything is new and fresh and alive, but not everything is clear. I heard a fellow say one time that when he first came to Christ, he didn't know very much at all. He said, I called Job Job and Psalms Palms, and I thought the Ten Commandments was a Charlton Heston movie, and Romans Road was the alley behind Fazoli's. So I didn't know anything. But God never does a half job. So why could this man not see clearly? When Jesus touched the blind man the first time, he restored his eyes completely. But he had to touch him the second time to teach him how to use them. There are some who believe that one trip to the altar is all they need from God. One trip is an end-all, fix-all for all of their troubles. They prayed for salvation, and now they have all they need. But the truth is, they can't see the whole picture clearly. Your sins have been forgiven, you're saved, and heaven will be your eternal home. You've been touched by God, and you're now whole. But young Christian, I want you to know that the Savior who touched you once can touch you again. The one who touched you and forgave you of your sins and erased your past, can touch you again and show you how to forgive other people. He can touch you again and teach you how to give instead of take. 
He can touch you again and give you wisdom and understanding of his word. He can touch you again and show you how to be a godly husband or to be a godly wife. He can touch you again and help you to be a godly father or a godly mother. He can touch you again and show you how to be a godly son or a godly daughter. He can touch you again and give you boldness to stand up for what's right in a world that's full of wrong. He can touch you again and again and again until you're able to see all things clearly. The man could see, and in verse 26 says, Then Jesus sent him home, saying, Don't go into the village. Don't go into the village. Now, some people suggested that Jesus' purpose here was to maintain secrecy. Don't tell anybody, because I just don't want them to know I'm here. But that kind of statement would suggest fear and a lack of confidence in the power of God. No one would touch Jesus until it was time. Nobody would kill him before he surrendered. Nobody would crucify him until he laid down his life. I don't think it was a matter of secrecy, but I believe that it was much more simple than that. Jesus said, don't go into the village, go home. When God saves you, you can't go back. Some people believe that since they've been saved, they can go back into their old hangouts and be among their old friends. They're convinced that they can live like their like Christ uh, life in their old atmosphere. Everybody around them might be drinking and doping, but they're not going to. Everybody around them might be sinning, but they're not going to. But it doesn't work that way. When God saves you, he not only saves you from your sin, but he also sanctifies you from your past. Those old places and those old people don't belong to the new you. They only know the old you. They only know the blind you. They can only relate to the old you, and they will be a detriment to the new you. Don't go into the village. Oh, but how are my old friends going to know that I've changed? They won't see you anymore. That's how they'll know. And if they're real friends, then they're going to come looking for you and find you in the presence of Jesus. Consider this. If Jesus found this man in the village and led him outside of the village to unfamiliar surroundings. And if once he healed him, it told him not to go into the village anymore, but to go home, where was home? Where was home? Home must have been somewhere other than where this man had been living. I believe that home might have been on the other side of the stream. I believe that his condition so degenerated his life that there was a time when he left home for the other side of the stream. He left his family and he left all that was good and he wandered into the nothingness of a community of people who were just as desperate and just as blind as he was. Jesus said, go home. The first place you need to be a witness for what God has done in your life is at home. It is at home. When Jesus cast the demons out of the possessed man in Gadara, he said, go home. Go home. Jesus said, go back to your house and prove yourself. Go back to your family. Go back to the people that love you and know you and let them know what God has done in your life. Go back to the wife of yours who's lived in poverty because of your problem. Go back to the woman who's cleaned up your messes and waited on your needs when you weren't able to take care of yourself. Go back to that bride who's worked outside of the home and inside of the home because she couldn't depend on you for help. Go back to that woman who stayed true to you through all of your problems and let her see the change that God made in your life. Go back to the children who only have known their daddy as a blind man. Go back to the kids who never who could never count on you to be there and to get out the baseball glove and get out the jump rope and play with your kids. Go back to those kids who've only seen their father as a beggar and a blemish on society. Those kids who bore the ridicule and the pain of daddy doing nothing right and you wrap your arms around them and promise them that from this day forward you're going to be a different father because now dad can see. Go home. There's an old hymn that we sing that even when I was a small boy used to bring a tear to my eye. It said, I've wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long I've tried. Now I'm coming home. Coming home, coming home, never more to roam. Open wide your arms of love because, Lord, I'm coming home. Wherever you are, God loves you. He wants to heal you and restore you and give you life. Get away from the atmosphere that keeps you down. Get away from the people who identify you by your sin. And come to Jesus, take him by the hand, and let him touch you and give you sight. Today is your day. Father, I pray that your will will be done in these minutes of invitation. God, I pray that those that the Holy Spirit is speaking to will boldly step out of their seats, drop to their knees, and God, allow you to restore their sight. 
Father, I pray today that lost people will be saved. God, I pray that backslidden will be raised up. But God, I pray that most of all, that all of us will seek to be changed by the presence of Jesus Christ that's in this place. Father, I thank you for what you're about to do and give you all of the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching today's message from Free Christian Church of God in Continental Ohio. To find out more information about Free Christian Church of God, or to receive a copy of Rev. James Fry's weekly television program, Your Life, call the church office at area code 419-596-3103 or visit our website at freecog.org and download your copy today.